Salutations everybody, it is Maddie here today and I played Borderlands 3 yet again. The difference this time, however, is it was a very extensive period of play and this is my brutally honest opinion. Now, for those who are uninitiated, the brutally honest opinion video series is designed around attending preview events, taking a dozen pages of notes, coming home with all of them and giving you all the information unfiltered, whether it be good or bad. So we have a lot of story details this time around because we played the game for a while. We have gameplay information and also I have a series of complaints that I hope this game can improve on. So let's fly through this introduction section. It's gonna be a lot shorter than previous intros in Brutally Honest Opinion videos. I played three plus hours with Flack the Beastmaster during the prologue section on Pandora, just over an hour on Eden 6 with a character of my choosing, so I selected Moe's the Bot Jock, and this totaled up for roughly five hours of gameplay, so I saw a lot of this title, man, a lot more than I ever have in any other preview event, so I got a lot to go over. I played a near final build of the game despite the game recently going gold, so I thought this was a strange choice, but I do imagine this was because of planning for the event. Lastly is travel, something that I always disclose in case my flight or hotels are paid for because I do not excrete money sadly and therefore I have to make sure everyone's aware of that stuff but this time around no expenses paid because this event was close enough for me to drive to so that kind of diminishes the argument some people say where they go it can't be a brutally honest opinion because you have a hotel paid for you and that totally has something to do with the game but anyway let's shift on over to the story. Now we have a lot of story details to go over this time, more than I've ever had access to in a preview, and with that in mind, there may be some minor spoilers about the introduction of the game involving its villains, the fate of some characters, etc. A lot of this has been pointed out in trailers, talked about in discussions, videos of my own in fact, but if you've avoided that kind of stuff entirely, this is your warning. I will have timestamps in the description down below if you want to hop to the gameplay section and onwards where there won't be any spoilers visual or audio wise. You have my word. So let's get this all started. It begins with us learning that the vault map from the end of Borderlands 2 is lost and now the children of the vault have united all the bandits under one banner led by Troy and Tyrene Calypso and that this vault map will lead them to a supposed quote great vault end quote. Now admittedly I thought that starting the game on Pandora was a smidge of a bold move because this game is very much being marketed as this intergalactic adventure and while it sounds great on paper you do risk not getting off to a strong start because there is that sense of familiarity. We've trekked all over Pandora for multiple games. It's it's time to move on and we're all ready for that and that's what the main reason a lot of people are excited for this game is for and the demo really did confirm some of my suspicions because I did get that feeling immediately of I've seen this before I've been here before but some new faces and interactions wiped away any nostalgia in exchange for a newer experience trekking this territory yet again was fun and you only spend about 10 levels here so there isn't really any overstaying its welcome now the more intriguing part in my opinion is not the environments here but rather the introduction of Tyrene and Troy Calypso. For starters, a big reason that Tyrene is rounding up all these bandits is because she eats them. Yep. The consumption of humans fuels her siren abilities, but also her brother. Now, Tyrene referred to Troy as a parasite, saying he was attached to her from birth, and also her feeding helps him. So I felt this bit alone separated them from Handsome Jack, who was evil for his own reasons, and I also liked how there was a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with the Calypso twins early on, because a lot of times you'd have Handsome Jack yelling at you over the Echo device, something that you will see in this game, but I really did appreciate that the game really wanted to get these twins in your face early on. They referenced their father a couple of times, but I do imagine that this will be a mystery that's saved for later in the tales. Now, the Calypso Twins are a hilarious representation of your modern Twitter user who films and streams and uploads everything that happens in their lives because we can't just enjoy life alone, we just gotta post it all on the internet and they represent that quite a bit. While it gives a comedic edge to the Twisted Duo, I actually think it gave me the ability to believe that these bandits could be united because, you know, they, they're so stupid, you're like, how could you get all these people together? But the ability to post anything anywhere led to me really buying into that and also a little bit of less questioning when Tyreen will start yelling at you like any Borderlands character 
over the Echo device. The game really managed to establish early on that these antagonists are powerful considering how easily they handled Lilith without a single issue and Lilith being my favorite character in the entire Borderlands series, this made me a sad boy. A notable thing during conversations when you're not in cutscenes is that characters are more animated than ever. They usually don't just stand there and talk but rather walk around, move their arms, jump and so on. Furthermore, the big story moments seem to be delivered through actual cutscenes rather than audio on the Echo device. This is a fantastic change because it shows that story is an actual focus for this game rather than resting on the laurels of a surprise factor that I feel really helped raise Borderlands 2 from a great game to an excellent game. I have some thoughts on how side quests work in this game and while I feel the context best fits the gameplay section, I figured it slots in under questing, so I'm gonna leave it here. Side quests really involve a lot more environmental interaction, puzzles, and thought. There's still that quirkiness, humor, character development, and such, but I noticed all my questing on Pandora pushed me to observe my environment. One side quest had me shoot a pipe and put water on the floor and then shoot a switch that then turned on electricity, creating a current to turn on an elevator and lead me to some loot. Another had me do an aerial melee attack down on a trap door to force it open and allow me to get a quest object. It encouraged the game's verticality and made all the pieces of the environment important and ultimately drove me to appreciate the level design even more. So with all that said, that does it for the story details because my section on Eden 6 didn't really gleam any additional info considering it was very much an isolated period of play from the extensive portion I did test. So let's move on over to the gameplay. Gameplay, as I mentioned, I spent a large chunk of my time with as Flack. So let's get into what this guy can do. Out of the characters I've played so far, he stands out the most. Flack boasts not only three skills to switch between like any other character in Borderlands 3, but also three pets. His first ability is the Gamma Burst, which causes a radioactive looking explosion that damages enemies and also increases the size of your pet currently equipped, giving them a buff. Now, if you also use this ability on a pet, you can revive them with 30% of their health on use. Ability number two is Rack Attack, where he sends an explosive rack that automatically tracks your opponent, flies to them, and they blow up for lots of damage. Lastly is the ability to fade away, which puts Flack in a cloak sort of similar to what we know from Zero in Borderlands 2, except Flack's next three attacks do critical damage, and this one was my personal favorite because, oh my goodness, you can shred some enemies. If you have a shotgun, you go in cloak, and you pull up at close distance and blast a fool, oh my gosh, you will take down anyone with ease, and it's a really great feeling. As for the pets, Flack can be supported by a Skag, Spider Ant Centurion, or a Jabber. Each of these pets are competent allies from my experience, but they also provide unique buffs. When you have the Jabber at your side, Flack's movement speed is increased by 5%. The Spider Ant will give Flack the buff of constantly regenerating health at 1% of his max health per second. And lastly is the Skag, who will apply a 5% damage buff. Now, I think the most practical ones are probably having the Jabber or the Skag at your side. You can also hold the left bumper while aiming at an enemy to tell your pet to attack attack specific targets. Personally, I didn't like the button mapping on this because sometimes you trigger your ability, sometimes you'd sick your pet on the wrong enemy, and perhaps it's because I used an Xbox controller where the left bumper is more of a click and hold rather than maybe PlayStation where the bumper is a little softer to the touch, where you can still distinguish it a little bit easier, but overall I would have loved to have that map to another button for Flack. Flack really felt like the ideal solo character given his interactions with the beast. Also having an ally by your side and one that has great synergy with your abilities brings a pseudo cooperative feel that none of the other classes I've tested had. More interestingly, Flack fares well separately from these beasts, making them an added bonus to his kit and not him being over-reliant on said beast, which we've seen so many pet classes in the past fail with, and so it's good to know that Flack's a good character, and then the aesthetic and the awesome buffs that these pets bring that you can also increase with his skill tree make it all the more enjoyable for him. And it's good to know because based off polls I've seen on Randy Pitchford and Matt Cox's Twitter, I mean, people are really looking forward to Flack. And I had a blast with him, and given that he was the character I was planning on playing this whole time, that makes me very, very happy. Now, given that I played with Flack in the prologue section, now is a good time to mention the way the guns felt early on versus the two other times where I was more mid-game, one being on Eden 6 and one being at the Borderlands 3 preview event where all of us were there for the big reveal. Now, I gotta say, man, 
I didn't like the guns early game, and I know there's some of that trending upwards, that scaling that makes the guns late game feel good, and when you're in the end game, even better. Don't get me wrong, I totally understand that, but it was something with the gun models. For example, I'd have a revolver that it didn't have a sight, so when you aimed in, the gun would cover a big chunk of your screen and I'd lose targets very easily while ADSing. I found this to be quite an issue, and I was a little flustered over it because I thought the shooting in this game is so good. I'd argue destiny levels at times. It feels very, very competent. It's a great shooter, which is surprising to see with all of its RPG elements implemented in there, but the early game guns really don't showcase that and I noticed that because the immediate difference happened when I hopped into the mid game playthrough on Eden 6 and I was shooting things like a champ everything felt like it was rolling a lot better but that's part of the gameplay loop I feel for Borderlands you start off a little bit slow and you trend upwards and all of a sudden you're rip roaring all over the level it's the excitement of discovering good loot but still I think given the fact that I complimented the shooting so much in my initial brutally honest opinion video you should be made aware that off the rip I don't think it's as strong but that's part of Borderlands so if you're new here, that's how it kind of works. Now let's take a look at Moe's. Moe's has one single ability, calling in her Iron Bear, aka Titan from Titanfall. And then you can equip two of her abilities to the Iron Bear. These abilities represent the weapons on it, such as a minigun, grenade launcher, and railgun. The augments, which every tier in a skill tree has, by the way, can adjust the elemental effects. So for example, you could assign cryo or explosive rounds to your minigun. Most felt more cooperatively driven because some of her abilities involve companions getting on the iron bear. She also struck me as a character that ascends into something much greater, like I was sort of alluding to with the weapon progression. I began my playthrough with having 22 skill points to spend, but but given the slow cooldown and the power curve initially, it may take a while for her to hit her stride, which I think also puts a bigger emphasis on her being a cooperative character. Understandably so, because this thing is a tank when you get inside, it can really both soak and deal damage. Moses' adventure took me to Eden 6, a location decorated with lush forests, green as far as the eye can see, tall tree villages that were clearly inspired by Kashyyyk, and a neat cross between futuristic and primal that I really liked. During my time here, I realized how little green you actually see in Borderlands 3, and when I pieced together my initial playtime during the event in May, the prologue from earlier, and this planet here, it's clear that Borderlands 3 will boast some serious variety in its environments. Considering that and the interactions that quests bring with said environment, it made me a very, very happy camper that the levels are so nice. Lastly, there are a ton of quality of life improvements hitting this series, more so than I think people are ready for, and I think they're going to be big game changers for a lot of us, so I'm going to sling them at you in a rapid fire fashion. There are intermittent waypoints, so traversing multi-floor interiors isn't as confusing as in previous Borderlands game when you're going through the title for the first time. I think this is a really big point to emphasize because we all remember getting lost on the inside of buildings in Borderlands 1 before they did the Game of the Year edition. The D-pad allows you to switch from quest to quest by clicking left or right. This is huge given the sheer amount of quests you can acquire at once and it makes you wonder how this actually wasn't in the series until now but I'm so happy it is there. It doesn't put you in the menus constantly, it keeps you in the game and that is great news. Enemies are also more interactive just like I was mentioning with the environment. For example, you can shoot the wings off a of Varkid thus grounding them. It turns them into not just, oh boy a flying enemy, best take out my gun, I can't melee them here, but actually actually a creature that you can dismantle and change based off your attacks. Lots has changed for the shooting as well, such as the continued building of elemental interaction. There was actually one time where I used my fire-based SMG on a puddle and it converted it into some wild magma steam pile. I don't really know how to describe it, but pretty much it was an elemental effect that could damage my enemies. Even guns with more kick, such as a shotgun, sent enemies flying on their butts, making the player feel more powered thanks to the physics in this game. Now, given Borderlands 3 more frantic nature with particle effects, explosions, bullets, and body parts flying everywhere, a nice little change is an audio-based cooldown that lets the player know when their ability's cooldown is coming to a close. I think this is really helpful given all the action happening on screen and convenience Run! 
is a major part of the quality of life changes. You can now fast travel to your vehicle from the map, thus keeping the flow going a little bit more, just quickly exiting areas and not having to search for your vehicle. I like this a lot. And this bulk of quality of life changes just shows that they've had so much time to work on this game and they've really honed down to pretty much any complaint we've had with Borderlands in the past and fixed it in this game, which is excellent news. Oh, and there's also Sanctuary 3 featuring easily, easily one of my favorite tracks in the entirety of the Borderlands franchise. Just give this a listen real quick. Oh man, it is, oh my God, that is a scary good track, man. That's gonna be in the background of a lot of videos. That is some good stuff. But as for the Sanctuary 3 itself, its layout, it didn't feel confusing, which a lot of games can't nail their hub environments. I liked how everything was connected, where everyone was placed, and I think this is gonna serve as a great hub environment. There's really nothing to add on to here because a lot of this was revealed in the gameplay reveal event for Borderlands 3. But lastly is a new section. Normally I do story, gameplay, sound, but we're leaving sound out of this because there wasn't anything new I could add to it. And rather I have complaints because I've spent a lot more time with the game. So I have a lot more stuff to be critical about. In an effort to bring mission variety, Gearbox might've slipped up a little bit because there is a mission where you enter a simulation, so to speak, and it has you backtrack into an area you just explored for a main story mission, except this time there's a weird on-screen effect the whole time to represent you being in a simulation. And I, I don't wanna be extra here, I'm not stretching the truth, but this legitimately gave me a headache, okay? Like, it was so bad, I was honestly thinking to myself, I wouldn't be upset if this whole quest got scrapped. Like, it was that mind-numbing to me. And I really, really didn't like that because I got what they were going for. There was the creative energy there. I really appreciate that, but man, do something with that visual effect because it hurt my head big time. Next is this scary feeling of a monster closet that this game brought. Now, for those who don't know, a monster closet in a game is something you can see in a Call of Duty campaign where the soldiers will keep respawning until you reach a certain point in the level and then they'll stop spawning and you can move onwards without having to constantly kill enemies in an endless fashion. Now, this was only notable when I was on Eden 6 and entering King Bobo's village. It was just an endless amount of enemies that seemingly felt non-stop eventually they did but dialing down the count in this area really wouldn't have hurt the experience and actually man it just must have been something with eden 6 because there was also this boss fight that felt really unbalanced maybe in solo play i kept getting down by a ground pound attack from king bobo that tracks you and since his minions kept respawning so i could revive myself via the fight for your life feature it became overwhelming in a solo environment and maybe this would have been better in co-op admittedly the 2k reps said this part could be done in co-op but it was never a actual requirement but i died three times in this fight and and a lot of times when I went down, I had really no idea what was going on. I just saw an explosion and I was dead. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm very confused what's happening here. Also, the FPS drops on occasion. Now, this is where the not a final build aspect should come up. This is something to keep in mind and it would skip at very random points. It really wasn't when the action picked up, but more so just moving around the world. So it might've been when something was loading in in the distance. And lastly, I already mentioned this early in the game, but the shooting felt a little unclean early on. And I think that can hurt some of the initial experience for the title. But overall, I still had a blast with Borderlands 3. I'm still very much looking forward to playing the full game at launch, but these are a list of complaints that I felt needed to be mentioned because that feeling of the monster closet, I thought to myself, oh boy, this is just one little section of the game, little piece of the pie. But what if that's representing a much bigger experience across multiple levels? I didn't have that in the reveal events. I didn't have that much in the Pandora section, but I did have it on Eden 6 where it seemed like a lot of enemies were constantly coming and it felt 
very much endless. So these are just some things I wanted to put on your map. I do appreciate you guys tuning in once again, giving me your trust. It is my honor to serve you and give you guys the most accurate coverage possible from these events so you know exactly what's happening with the games you're interested in, in step by step. So with that, I will conclude the video. If you're new here, I do have a Patreon. It helps fuel all the content I create here. Other than that, stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.